So, good morning. Good morning, everybody. And I um, hope everybody had a good uh, Shabbat and a good weekend. As we always begin with saying the bracha and the, on the blessing that God gave us, coffee. So, uh, we'll start with a bracha. Baruch atah adinai lehinem melech olam shakol niya bidvarei. Okay, so, sorry for that buzzing. Put it on, do not disturb. Um, so, you know, the question that we're asking, you know, afterlife, is there an afterlife? Should you care? It, this is a very, very weighted subject. And I will say up front that it's, uh, to give it the full um, attention, maybe it's something that deserves to be spread over in very, several classes. We're going to give a couple of ideas about it today, and uh, we'll see we'll see where we get with it. We'll start with a um, one of the sort of Jewish uh, type jokes. Uh, last week, uh, Jackie Mason went to heaven, and uh, so the story is told about. Uh, a good a Jew by the name of Moshe. Moshe's father went to heaven, and as we know, the good Jewish custom is that we say Kaddish. We say Kaddish for our parent. So Moshe was extremely meticulous to come to synagogue for uh, for the eleven months that we say Kaddish, and um, three times a day for Shacharit, for Mincha, for Mariv, three times a day where we uh, say the uh, the Kaddish. And so it went on for 11 months. He was extremely good about it. Um, okay, fine. A couple of years later, Moshe's mother passes away. And he doesn't show up for synagogue. He comes maybe once in a while, whatever it is. And the rabbi approaches him and says, Moshe, he says, you know, I remember that for your dad, you were extremely uh, careful and extremely... Uh, uh, dedicated to go ahead and come for your father's Kaddish. I mean, why isn't it that for your mom? We don't see you. So he said the following, he says, look, he says, I know Kaddish is something that helps the soul reach its, the Garden of Eden, Gan Eden, Gan Eden. He says, you know, <laughs> he says, I wanted to make sure for 11 months, I said Kaddish to make sure my father gets to Gan Eden. He says, now that my mother has passed away, one thing I know is that if they're going to be there together, they both won't have any Gan Eden. They both won't have any paradise. That's why I'm not so careful. So this is a, you know, a classic Jewish joke on the lighter side. But to approach this topic and the subject in its proper seriousness, um, there is a, a question. I want to, as I mentioned, this is a very weighty and a broad subject. I want to talk about it from one more modern perspective. And this class, to give credit where credit is due, this class is very much based on the, on the uh, a class given by Rabbi Schneir Ashkenazi, a, a, an amazing uh, lecturer in Israel. Uh, his classes are available in Hebrew on YouTube. I believe, I believe that it is the largest weekly Torah class on social media on YouTube, uh, which uh, receives fifty to 60,000 viewers every single class that he gives, which is amazing. And uh, this class is in part based on, on the class that he gave last week. And also, I wrote up some of it in my Friday Dvar Torah on Facebook. So uh, there will be uh, uh, one of the stories that I will repeat, the main story, because it's an amazing story. So I will repeat this story here today. Now, one of the uh, questions, uh, the, you know, the, these weeks in general, we're reading in Deuteronomy, and the Torah repeats again and again and again that if you will fulfill God's commandments, God says you'll do what I, what I command you, you'll be received blessing, you will be... Uh, you'll be uh, rewarded, and if not, uh, unfortunately, you'll have the opposite, opposite of blessing, etc. Um, and the question that many commentaries ask is that when the Torah discusses reward and punishment, it talks all about material, physical blessings. Nowhere in the Torah is it, direct, is it clearly spelled out what would seem to be a, an amazingly greater blessing 
is the reward that one receives in the world to come, in paradise, in the Garden of Eden, etc., etc., which in the prophets and in the Talmud is discussed in great detail. Um, so why is it that the Torah itself, the five books of Moses, the written Torah, what we call Torah Shebiktav, the written Torah, nowhere is it explicitly mentioned the reward that we will receive after, in the afterlife. Um, that, the, that the afterlife exists and so on is something, again, as mentioned, is clearly said in the oral Torah. Uh, it's alluded to in the five books of Moses in various places, but not clearly spelled out. Why does the Torah leave that out? And that's a question that many ask. And, um, you know, commentaries of all, of all uh, uh, ages, early commentaries, later commentaries, all ask these, this question. I mean, just in yesterday's Torah portion, and I read first the Hebrew and then the English, and this is in the Shema, in the second portion of the Shema that we say every single day, at least uh, twice a day, three, at least three times a day, essentially. So here we, here is the verse. im tishmu. If it'll be, if you will listen al mitzvotai to my mitzvah, says God, asher anochim etzav etchem ayom that I command you la'avot Hashem alekechem to love God. When nasati metar arzachem, I will give. Uh, the rain in your land in its proper time, Yoreo Malkoja, different seasons, and you will gather in your grain and your, uh, your, your grapes and wine and your corn and so on, the oil. And Asate Isa Basotka, I will put, I will put grass um, and uh, vegetation in your fields. And if you will serve God, then the, the, the Torah continues and says that there will not be rain. God will hold back the rain from heaven, etc., etc. So here the Torah again and again uh, stresses, stresses the physical material reward. And again, Moshe Rabbeinu leaves out the spiritual reward. So... You know the the the. If you look at the Mishnah in period in, in ethics of the fathers, the Mishnah says the following. The Mishnah says, I quote over here in Hebrew again because I have it in the original Hebrew and out of the translation. Haolam hazeh. This world is domeli prosdar. This world is compared to a prosdar to to a to an antechamber to a, a preparing room. Befnei olam haba before the world to come. Prepare yourself in the preparing room, in the antechamber, in order you should go into the, the ballroom. You should go into the main ballroom. And he would say like this. This is, I believe, from Hillel. Okay? So he says the following. He says, Who are ya, Omer? He would say like this. He would say like this. I'm quoting the second part of the Mishnah. I'll get to the first part of the Mishnah later. It is more pleasant. One moment shall korat ruach of pleasure bolam haba in the world to come from the entire mikol from the entire life in this world. One moment, one shahar, one hour of pleasure, of delight in the world to come is greater and more and 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 and. Uh, and more, de more enjoyable, desire, de desirable, appreciated, etc. Et from the entire pleasure that you could have in this world. And uh, we know that in many of the commentaries and in many places in the Talmud and in 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 our eth books of our ethos, eth you know, ethical books and so on, it talks about how why you should do mitzvahs in this world because. You're going to come, you're going to be merit, so that we should merit the world to come, where the pleasure and the reward will be immeasurable. So again, here the question um, is asked, why does the Torah not mention it? Now, the, the, besides the fact, besides the fact, I want, I want to uh, elaborate on this point, besides the fact that the Talmud and uh, the Kabbalah and Jewish mysticism tell us about the afterlife and tell us about the world to come, it is also quite uh, um, logical that we come to that conclusion that there is an afterlife based on various factors. And uh, some of it is mentioned, of course, in the commentaries, but I want to just give simple logic. Simple logic is that reward 
reward has to come from the fact that reward is given to that or to the person which which uh, earns the reward and in a way that can be appreciated by the person um, receiving the reward. So, so if you're going to go ahead and give a only material reward, there's something fundamental that's going to be missing. How so? A person, when in, in creation, when God created the human being, there's a significant uh, difference between how the animal world, the vegetation world is created, and how the human being is created. With regards to animals, with regards to every th other part of creation that has life, the Torah just says it was created as one, um, you know, as its physical and its spiritual were created as one. Highlighting the fact that the physical and the spiritual element of it are, are, not, are, are much closer to one another and they're created as one. When it comes to the creation of man, the Torah this, gives an, a critical distinction. It says, first, God created the body from earth. God gathered earth and created the body. And then he blew within that body a ruach chayim, a life, a soul, and so on. Which is why the human being has a much greater, uh, a soul which is far greater than its materialistic existence. Which is why we are not satisfied when we just live a life of materialism. Because there's a soul, there's a real neshama, a spirit of God pumping within us that was created and put together as part of our purpose and mission in creation. So, if you're going to give reward to who does the mitzvah, when you do a mitzvah, you do a good deed, you give charity, you put on tefillin, you keep kosher, you, you, uh, you uh, visit the sick, right? Etc., etc. Who is doing that mitzvah? Is it the physical body that's doing that mitzvah or is it the soul that's doing the mitzvah? Now, the soul needs the body, but primarily what's, who's doing the mitzvah is your neshama, your soul, Right? You know, it, there's there's to to, di to to divert for a moment, but within the same point, there's a there's a a, a strong feeling within yourself that we, that we have a soul. In other words, that we're not just a a, a robot, an android. You know, when you you walk down the, in some of the amusement parks or, or or Manhattan, and you have this nice, cute little robot that comes over to you and laughs or cries and reacts to you know. It, there's no feeling that that machine has. There's no I. There's no emotions. It's just it's just programmed. But a human being has a soul that has feelings, it has it has a drive, it has disappointments. These are these are all part of our soul. And that is what's part of what's invested in when we do a mitzvah. So it would not make sense that the reward which the Torah says, which is all material reward, would just would stop at that, at material reward, which is only something that the body primarily enjoys. The soul doesn't care about, about, about uh, material uh, blessings. The soul doesn't, that's not what it enjoys. The soul enjoys holiness, spirituality, godliness. And that's why, in the words of King Solomon, who says it very clearly, that, uh, uh, that, the, that the body will return to the ground, the haruach, Tashuv el hello The soul returns back to God. So there's clearly on um, various uh, reasons and in, uh, both both scripturally and from the commentaries and also logically that there is an afterlife and there is a Gan Eden. That's without question because we believe and it makes sense, etc., etc. But that only highlights even more the question. Of why is it, of why is it that um, the Torah does not mention the reward that we will have in Olam Abba, which is far greater. It's almost like hiring a worker to do a job, and it's a, it's a valuable job, which pays six figures. And when asked on the contract to sign the agreement, to say, you know what, I will give you a comfortable chair. I'll give you a comfortable office. But, but, but what's... The main, the main payment and reward is missing in the contract. Something doesn't make sense. And we're talking about here an immeasurable greater reward.
So that's the question that's being discussed over here. So, various commentaries give us different answers. It's interesting that we actually have opposing answers. There's the Klei uh, there's other commentaries. Some commentaries tell us that the reason why the Torah only gives us, tells us about physical reward is because um, that's what we could relate to over here. We don't really know an are not able, capable of truly appreciating the reward in the world to come. Because we, right now, as our soul sees things through the lens of the body and the physical, we, um, we basically can't properly appreciate the... the uh, it's like a child. We, you know, a child, when you want to motivate them to do something, you say to them things that our child could relate to. You know, if you clean up the dishes, uh, you'll, get to, you'll, get to, you'll get an ice cream right afterwards. Right? Um, so this, since we could only relate to the more physical, so that's what the Torah tells us. That's one explanation. There's another explanation, just the other way around. Uh, one of the commentaries, I'm trying to remember who is it that says that, I think it's maybe the Rabbeinu Baha'i, it says the other way around. That the Torah is, does not discuss the reward in the afterlife, because that's a given. That's a given, we don't need... Uh, the Torah doesn't have to tell us because that's a, an absolute given. The Torah tells us that not only will you have the given reward in the afterlife, you will also have material blessings. Okay. So those are two of the commentaries. Amongst many others. Again, because of the limitation of time, I want to get to. I want to get to. Uh, I want to get to uh, to the answer, and and I want to share the story, which is an amazing story. I mean, when I read the story, it, it really did bring tears to my eyes, and and and. And perhaps because my dad is a, is a Holocaust survivor, so so it, it spoke to me in a way. But this is a story. It's 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 a chilling story. There was a Jew by the name of Reb Yitzchak Shloime Ungar. Okay, if I could ask the audience to bear with me for a moment, because the AC was not turned on, <laughs> it's kind of uncomfortable. Give me ten seconds for me to turn on the AC. Meanwhile, you could think about what we've discussed till now. Just give me 10 seconds. Okay, we're back. We're back. We're back here to discuss Torah. Please forgive me. Okay, so... There was a Jew by the name of Reb Yitzchak Yitzchak Shleimah Ungar. He went ahead and he founded the the uh, the what's called in Israel Chug Chatam Sofer or Chasam Sofer. Chasam the Chasam Sofer was a was a, a tremendous uh, Torah authority about probably about two hundred and fifty years ago, and he was a, the chief rabbi of Pressburg in Hungary, and um, so Chatam Sofer became the name of a community. And he established this community in Israel right after the war. Uh, he was a survivor. And um, it, today it's one of the major uh, kashrus, uh, kosher author, uh, authorization uh, um, uh, department sort of in Israel. One of the, what's called the hechsherim, that which uh, with, you know, kosher symbols on products. In Israel it's called Chug Chatam Tzofer. So this uh, Yitzchak Shleimer went ahead and he established the community after the war to rebuild and so on. He says one day a Jew uh, by the name of Akiva Steinberg, I mean this, and this was this was um, <clears throat> uh, this, this is about Akiva Steinberg this goes back, this is now fast forward 33 uh, years after, in Israel this is after this community was established and by now Rabbi Yitzhak Shleiman was already an older Jew, of course. This is 
30 years or 33 years after the war. And there was a Yid by the name of Akiva Steinberg. Akiva Steinberg approached uh, our Rabbi Yitzchak Shlomo and he said to him like this, and he was all shaken up. He was all shaken up. He asks him, uh, you know, what's going on? So he says, last night I had a, a dream that, that I just can't shake off. It was a dream that got into my kishkes, as we say in Yiddish. He says, but in order for me to explain the dream, I have to give you background. I must give you background. He says, what's the, tell me. So he says like this. He says, this happened in 1944. It was the end of 1944. I was in Auschwitz. And I had, there was a, there was a, another fellow inmate uh, that was in my barrack. And um, his name was Aryeh. This Aryeh was a, a very sincere and pious individual. And one day Aryeh comes over to me and he says, this was, this was uh, right after Purim, so it was like a month before Pesach. And he says to me, he says, I must have matzah for Pesach. Pesach is matzah on Pesach, is the only biblical food that we have an obligation to eat, is specifically this food. There's no other food in the Jewish diet. Okay? No, no sushi, no, 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 no gefilte fish, kugel, those, those are all fine, latkes. But the only biblical food today that we eat, which is a mitzvah in the Torah, the others are customs or rabbinical uh, mitzvahs, which are important, but it's not a biblical mitzvah, it's matzah. And he said to me, says um, Akiva, he says, Arye says to me, I must have matzah for Pesach this year. At least a minimum amount, which is a kazais, which is like a third of a matzah depending on the size of the matzah, the thickness of the matzah, but I must have them in. I said to him, I said, what are you, you like, you like uh, to use today's language, do you think you're in the Taj Mahal over here? I mean, you know, we're, we're, we're in Auschwitz. You, you, know, you don't get matzah in Auschwitz. You know, this is not like a smorgasbord where you order what you want and say, matzah, please. It doesn't happen. So, <clears throat> he says, I must get matzah. One day, as we are walking to, you know, back from our day of labor, backbreaking labor, uh, there was, this is towards the end of the war, and there was uh, an Allied attack, and they attacked some of the, some of the storage, um, some of the storage uh, warehouses that the Germans had, and when we were walking back, there was actually one of the storage warehouses that were hit was a grain, a grain, a silo or a grain storage. And uh, there was actually grain laying around. So I quickly, without you know making sure not to be noticed, I quickly went ahead. I grabbed two handfuls of grain, one for me and one for my friend, Arye. And, um, you know, and we hit it. We hit it. And... Um, I don't know if the next day, we went ahead, we found a moment that we could, or a quiet spot. We, uh, we made a little ditch, we started a fire, we found some rocks. We, we, uh, we uh, went ahead and we uh, sort of pounded the grain, made it into flour, which if we're caught, we're, we're literally putting our life on the line. And we managed to bake enough matzah, enough matzah, just enough for the two of us. A kazait, the exact measurement for the two of us. And we were so joyous. And as we're walking back to our barracks and we're like, our hands are like against our bodies so to make sure that the matzah doesn't fall out as we're trying to hide the matzah, the guard notices that we're walking a little different than usual. And uh, he asks, tells us, he orders us to open our arms and of course the matzah falls out. And he starts to kick me. It's actually I was carrying the matzah, says Akiva, for both of us. He starts to kick me. I, I, I almost lost consciousness from the from the pain of the of the beating that I got. However, however, to my delight, 
as I got back into the barracks, there was one pizza, piece of matzah that got, sort of got stuck in my, my garment. And um, the, the beating and all that, I was, I was overjoyed that I still was managed to salvage a piece of matzah. I had matzah, but I only had enough matzah for one of us. It came the night of Pesach, and Arya comes over to me and he says the following. He says, I beg of you that you should give up your piece of matzah and let me have the matzah. I must fulfill, I don't know how much longer I'm going to live in this hell. And I, I really would like to have the matzah, please, I beg you. Arya says, and I say to him, I say, Akiva says to Arya, I say to him, I say, look, I got the beating. I risked my life over here. I got the beating. Um, you know, why should I give you the matzah? You know, it, it, I tried to get for you too, but it wasn't meant to be. And Arya says, I know you're right. You are 100% right. However, I will give you like a contract, a handshake, uh, whatever it takes. You could have the reward for the mitzvah. You could have the reward for the self-sacrifice and beating and putting yourself on the line. You could have all that. I just want the matzah. I do not know how much longer I'll be on this earth and I'm, I really would like to have the matzah. I'm going to give you the reward for this mitzvah, which is a mitzvah for this, you know, this kind of mitzvah. I give you the reward. I give you Somehow he pleaded, and, and, and I just couldn't say no, and I gave him the matzah. This is the background story that Akiva is telling uh, Yitzhak Moyeshleim Ungar. He said, last night, last night I had a dream, 33 years later, Arye came to me in a dream. And Arye said to me that... I know we made up, I know we made up that you get the reward for the mitzvah and the mitzvah is yours. But now I'm in the world to come, I'm in the afterlife and I rec recognize the value, the greatness of the reward of this mitzvah. Can you please, I know we have an agreement, can you please give me back the reward for this mitzvah? This was the request that Arya gave to me in my dream last night. And I don't know what to do. I gave him the matzah. I was beaten for the matzah. I put my life on the line. And nevertheless, I gave it to him. But we had an agreement that I get the reward for that wonderful mitzvah. And now he wants it from me. I mean, I, I don't want to do that. I mean, what, what am I supposed to do? But, but on the other hand, the soul comes from the world to come from the Garden of Eden or whatever it is, I mean, I don't know what to do. Rabbi Ungar hears the story and he says, look, he says, this is, this is a, a uh, this is a, 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 um, a very, very difficult question that is not for me. This you have to go to a, a Rebbe, to a Hasidic master and tzaddik and holy man of, of, of a previous generation, meaning uh, an, an elderly tzaddik who knows and appreciates and, and, and has an insight. Uh, so so th let's go. So therefore he said to him, look, he said, let, let us go to the, um, to the Admoir. I, I, you know, I'm not familiar with who this is, but he refer referred to him as the Admoir, the Rebbe of uh, Machnufke. I hope I'm pronouncing it right. I guess it was one of the Polish great Rebbes of previous generation he says let's go to him let's present him the question because this is beyond my pay grade to answer this question so they went to him and uh, he uh, he heard the the, the, the Admur listened to the question and then he, he listened to the, the, the Rebbe the Rebbe listened to the question that uh, Akiva and Rabbi Ungar um, presented to him and he said like this, this is the answer. He says like this, you should forgo. You should forgo and give up the mitzvah after 33 years. You should give him 
to Aryeh, the soul that's come to you, and you should give him the reward for the mitzvah. And he said to him the following. He says, let me tell you why. He says, how many blessings, how many mitzvahs did you merit to do in these 33 years? How much film did you put on? Etc., etc. How many people have you helped while being here in this world? But Rab Aryeh, which I forgot to mention this little detail in the story, that Rab Aryeh passed away shortly after that Pesach. He passed away in Auschwitz, an important detail that I left out. He did not make it. He did not make it out of Auschwitz. So you merited 33 years of doing so many mitzvahs. Rab Aryeh did not have that merit. He passed away, he passed away, he was murdered by the, by the Germans. You should give him the reward. And the Rebbe continued and said the following. He said like this, looking at the words over here. He says, the, the Rebbe continued with tears in his eyes and said like this, do you understand what's going on here? He says, we're talking about the holiest of the holiest, a person that died, what's called on Kiddush Hashem. Whenever a Jew is murdered because he's a Jew, it's called dying for the sanctification of God's name. He says <clears throat> he died in tremendous pain with torture. There's no greater reward for that. And yet, and, and he is in the, he's in heaven. There's no better place for a soul to be. Nevertheless, he's come down from that loftiest of places only to ask for the reward of one mitzvah that he did in this world. And we live here in a place of prosperity, in a place of relative calm, and so on and so forth. And how many mitzvahs do we not even pay attention to and we, and we don't fulfill? This is the story. It's, it, the story has various lessons and it's an amazingly powerful story. But within the context of our discussion, I want to explain the question that we've asked why the Torah speaks primarily only of material blessings. And that goes to, it, it, it addresses a fundamental um, approach of Judaism as maybe even opposed to some other religions. And even within Judaism there is there is different approaches and thoughts and so on. And and therefore this is a a, 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 a critical difference in some of the other uh, approaches, which is the reason why in the Torah God primarily talks about material blessings is to highlight that the Torah's focus is how to live as a Jew or as a servant of God, as opposed to what happens and what as uh, as opposed to dying as a servant of God. Meaning, as great as the reward and the light and immense pleasure of the soul is in the afterlife. That is not the purpose of the soul's creation. You know what the purpose of the soul's creation is? To do a mitzvah in the material world over here. The Torah talks about the material benefits. And as the Rambam puts it, Maimonides says like this, Maimonides says that the Torah gives us all these material blessings. That's not the reward and it's not what the Torah is trying to tell us. The Torah is telling you only that God will give you the, it's like a worker. You hire a worker, you have to give him the proper work environment for him to do his job. You can't hire a worker and expect him to do things that you don't give him the tools and the environment and the, and the ability to do it properly. So God says the material blessings is not your reward. It's not your pension. It's not your, it's not your salary. It is just the environment so that you should be able to do what needs to be done. But even more so, the material reward is a sign that your spiritual impact is affecting even the physical. Listen to that critical difference. Meaning, the objective of our, and the purpose, and the meaning of our life, and the goal in this world is not to earn credits for the world to come. That exists and that happens, but that's not the objective. The objective is to fulfill God's will in this world, to make this world our physical environment, our business environment, 
our material environment into a refined, more godly, more spiritual, more holy, more welcoming, more, 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 more pure, more kind, more giving, a world where, God, where God's vision and intention for how the world is supposed to act is materialized. That is our objective. And that's what the Torah addresses. The Torah gives us mitzvahs, 613 mitzvahs. Life is about fulfilling God's will. Reward, reward is not the objective. Reward is somewhat selfish. Why am I doing it? Because a reward I'm getting. But that's not the ultimate reason for why we serve and do what our God wants. It is because there are mitzvahs, there are commandments, there are instructions. And the objective of those instructions is to make, to transform this world, all those who we interact with, to be a better place. To use the language of the Medrash, God desired that he should have a place where he is comfortable in this physical world. That is the goal and purpose of your soul. It is for that reason that the Torah focuses on what you need to do, and the material blessings, because the material blessings are the work environment, number one, and number two, the material blessings is a sign when things are synced properly, when things are, things are not out of sync, which is a more complicated discussion, when things are synced properly, the material uh, uh, blessings that come are a direct result of the healthy, spiritual, holy environment that you create which is the objective of Torah and the objective of creation and the objective of your soul's purpose and mission in this world. That is the reason why the Torah talks in those terms. And that's a, a sort of like a, a critical, um, a, a fundamental approach and view of how we view ourselves, Torah, our purpose, etc. I mean, to use, to use a, I, I just want to quote a, 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 a actual um, quote from the Rebbe's talks, Mekute Sechis. I'm going to say it in Hebrew, then translate it, and with that we'll conclude today's, today's class. Tachlis ha-mechuven shal briyas adam hi, the ultimate objective of man's creation, loy avur ha-adam, it's not for us personally, for our own self-gratification uh, and reward, and the Kemoshel Medet Mishnah, like the Mishnah says, Ani nivreti koni. I was created to serve my Creator. And how do we achieve this goal? Al yidei kiyum mitzvahs We've achieved this uh, goal through fulfilling God's commandments and mitzvahs. Of course, God does not hold back our reward because you reward the, the worker, you reward the person who achieves this. And this reward has no limit, which is what Olam Abba is about. However, however, the, the greatest reward that we can achieve does not even come close to the fact that we fulfill our mandate, our mission, by our Creator, by God Almighty. And this is also highlighted uh, by the story that I mentioned, meaning that the ultimate and greatest reward that the soul senses even in the world to come is not its reward in the, in the, in the usual sense, but its appreciation that it has then in the world of truth, in the world of spirituality, without being obscured by all the, all the craziness of this material world, in the world to come, the soul truly, truly appreciates on a much greater level that which it has achieved by doing mitzvahs and fulfilling God's will. Which is why the story of Arya coming back after 33 years, why he came back and said, I want that reward. Meaning, of course, the mitzvah in itself is the greatest of all of it. But he also then appreciated on so much more of a deeper level what the reward of the mitzvah is. And it's the real reward, not just the reward getting paid for it, but the reward, the delight of, of the actual mitzvah in fulfilling God's will. I hope that is clear. So if you have any questions on this subject, I know it's a, a subject that has many different uh, uh, branches to it. You're welcome to ask. Um, 
remember that the cherish every moment you have in this world you know we're coming from corona we're coming from corona um, there were countries or societies that and this is also happens I, I deal with this as a rabbi all the time you sometimes have elderly people who are who are uh, on their deathbed and uh, or people who have gone through something traumatic and people advocate for pulling the plug I mean I've had I've had situations in life and without getting into this intricate uh, discussion which again is a class for a different time um, <clears throat> uh, the the approach of Judaism is that we value every single moment until the very last moment that a person is in this world because while the soul is in this world it is achieving its purpose and mission which it cannot achieve once it leaves this physical world. It receives the reward then, but the, the mission and purpose, every single moment, which is why we put so much value, whether a person is 80 years old and they have corona or whatever else it might be, or a person is 20 years old. The value of life is immeasurable. So may Hashem give us all health and um, do what you need to do to stay healthy, of course. Uh, and when we do what we do, Hashem will do the rest, God willing. Stay healthy, make sure that you uh, look after your loved ones, etc. And share these words of Torah. Thank you for listening. And have a blessed and fantastic week. And chaparain, we say in Yiddish. Chaparain, grab every mitzvah opportunity that you can while, while, you, while you still can for many more years to come. Have a fantastic week.